Sham referendums, annexations and a large conscription drive, Vladimir Putin is trying to salvage his special military operation. It means that this illegal war on Ukraine has now arrived in the middle of Russian society. But opposition seems to be growing, protests are increasing, and thousands of Russian men of fighting age are fleeing conscription. A true exodus of well-educated men has begun. They refuse to die for Putin's imperial ambitions. We ask on To The Point, protests and mass flight, is Russia finally turning on Putin? Hello and welcome on To The Point. Let me introduce today's panel. Maria Makiva, a journalist from Russia, currently living and working in Berlin and editor-in-chief of the Russian language TV channel Ostwest. Daniel Bressler, correspondent for the German broadsheet Süddeutsche Zeitung here in Berlin and a former correspondent in several Eastern European countries, including Moscow. Plus, our very own Roman Goncharenko, DW's Russia analyst, joining us from DW's Bonn headquarters. A warm welcome to uh, you all. Let's uh, start with this. Putin keeps escalating. The referendums, sham referendums, we have to say, nuclear threats, annexations and e possibly even sabotage of gas pipeline, even though uh, that's not confirmed. So let's talk about the pipelines uh, for a moment. And I'd like to start with you, Roman. Uh, in which way would Russia benefit from blowing up these pipelines? Well, I guess there are um, just a few points uh, how Russia could benefit benefit from it. Uh, the most obvious is this uh, sends gas prices um, um, sky high. So they are high now, extremely high, and they are still getting even higher and higher. So Russia will profit from that. Um, I'm not a legal expert, but I think this could... Um, lower the pressure on Russia to deliver some gas and to fulfill its obligations because um, Russia um, cannot say, uh, can say now, well, we don't know what happened. We were, we were, uh, it will take time to investigate. We do not know whether we can uh, point and say for sure who did it. So um, when Russia refused to take German turbines from Siemens uh, to deliver gas, it's one thing. Now it's, it's a different story. Mm. Um, of course, this will put enormous pressure on the societies in Western Europe where people are taking to the streets to protest against um, high energy prices. And last but not least, I think this is also uh, sending a signal to the West, look what we can do. We can hit your infrastructure under the sea. And there are um, important not just gas or oil pipelines, but also communication lines between the United States, North America and Europe. Mm. And Russia could, could, could just hint at that and say, and say, look, we can do it. Maria, do you agree? Is, is Putin trying to send a signal to the West here? If it's so, this is a very bad signal, I should say, because that means that he definitely believes uh, West that uh, they're really eager to switch to other sources of energy. And because it's very difficult to repair it, I mean, al almost impossible to repair all this stuff. And this is million, billions of uh, euro. So if he believes that and he decided physically tear up this connection, mm. what does it mean? I mean, that means that he's in his ve very final phase of, like, of his being as a president as a leader of the country. Burning the bridges, if you will. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is very bad news. Mm -hmm. And the, the main question for me now, like, will he use tactical nuclear weapon then? We come to that in a moment, Daniel. First, uh, do you think it is possible or even likely that Russia is behind these attacks on the gas pipelines? Yes, I think it is very likely. Of course, we don't uh, have any proof. No Western government has said so far that it was Russia. I think it is likely, and the fact that Russia denies it is uh, no proof at all. Uh, Russia has denied many things. Why, why is it likely? I think uh, it helps Russia right now in its main goal uh, to create fear, to create fear and to destabilize the West and to break the Western front supporting Ukraine. That's the main goal right now, and it supports this goal. Mm. So I think, yes, uh, it is very likely that Russia did this. 
So an, another uh, move uh, is, of course, uh, uh, the referendum uh, drive there in Ukraine. Uh, Vladimir Putin is pushing ahead with his plans to annex large parts of Ukraine. And uh, these so-called referendums in areas of Ukraine that are controlled by Russia are just his latest move. These are the images that Russia wants the world to see. People at polling stations exercising their right to vote and saying what Putin wants to hear. This means a lot to us because we are Russians by nature and now I hope we will become Russians for real. We are with Russia. Russia is with us. Anyone who doesn't want or is unable to visit a polling station will be visited by an election worker who will go to their homes to collect their ballots. It's difficult for residents in Russian-controlled territories to avoid voting. For some Ukrainians, it became the perfect time to leave these territories once and for all. The referendum is a violation of international law. It is illegal. We hear that people in the occupied areas are forced to vote at gunpoint. Kyiv calls Putin's referendum a propaganda stunt, while the West is citing international law to call it illegal. How much support does Russia really have in the occupied territories? And that's a question I'd like to pass on to Roman in Bonn. Uh, the referendums obviously are a sham. We have established that many times. But a lot of people in the Donbas are indeed pro-Russian. If these referendums were real, how much support could Putin expect? Well, it is a um, very theoretical question because um, to conduct a democratic referendum there, you first need peace, you need a possibility for all the hundreds of thousands of people who fled the region to come back. Uh, you need observers, of course, uh, and you need, um, you need uh, democratic parties, th things that we do not have there. And, and you don't, um, first of all, um, you need no soldiers there, no guns. There can be no fair or democratic voting with, at gunpoint, right? Mm. Uh, but um, back to your question, um, I think uh, these are four regions and the situation is uh, different in two of them. So the first, the regions Donetsk and Luhansk, which are um, de facto, or fact, factually occupied by Russia since 2014, at least parts of them. Mm. And uh, there um, we have people who are living there. Um, most of them, or many of them, um, supported uh, Ukraine, uh, supported uh, the idea of staying in Ukraine. We don't have uh, recent data, but some data conducted a few years ago suggested that uh, they didn't want to join Russia even after spending years there. Mm. But the situation could have changed since Russia started this this uh, open war in February because of the shelling, heavy shelling, and Russian propaganda. And uh, I do believe that maybe some some people, or maybe most of people who live there in, in the region of Donetsk, in the city of Donetsk itself, uh, could support joining Russia. But it doesn't mean that that gives Russia a right to annex mm. that territory. In the south of Ukraine, in the region of Kherson and uh, uh, parts of the Zaporizhia region, the city of Zaporizhia itself is still under Ukrainian Kiev control. The situation is very much different. And we've seen protests against the Russian occupation there in March and April. Um, Russia responded to that uh, with heavy um, reprisals against the uh, population there. But still, I think the general mood is in the south much more pro-Ukrainian pro than it is in the east. Now, let, now I'd like to bring in a, a viewer comment from one of, uh, of our YouTube viewers in, in the last uh, show. Jeff, Jeff Simpkins, he said, stop talking about settlements. Uh, this is win or lose. And uh, Zelensky also said that annexations would make peace talks impossible. Daniel... Does that mean fighting to the bitter end? Uh, I'm afraid, yes. I'm afraid that the signal uh, that uh, this actually sends, uh, the, annexation, the annexation, and that's what we have to expect of those territories, is there is no room for negotiations. And that's something that we have to understand. Uh, um, from a Russian point of view, uh, this will be Russian territories. From the point of view of Russian propaganda, that's very important. This will be Russian territories, so there's nothing to talk about. And that's what we have to understand, and that's what we have to understand in the question of support of Ukraine. What are we supporting Ukraine for? We're supporting Ukraine to, uh, to, uh, to enable it uh, to regain as much territory as possible.
Uh, Maria, you uh, mentioned a minute ago uh, the nuclear threats. Uh, these annexations, do you think uh, uh, that Putin will use them to justify uh, a, a nuclear attack? I think, unfortunately, this is a direct connection. I think a uh, referendum needed uh, for declare this is a new border. Let's make the negotiations um, and we will stop the war. The West, uh, Ukraine and the West, they say no. What's next step? Will the West say no, though? If, if Putin steps up to the table now and says, OK, uh, we have now annexed these bits of Ukraine, we're happy with it, uh, we stop fighting, will the West, how will the West respond? <laughs> I think the answer is uh, on the Ukrainian side. And they, of course, will say no. Mm. They couldn't say yes after all this. And, uh, yeah, so what will be the next step? I think there are several scenarios. And one scenario, at least, it's uh, to make this... Uh, tactical use of nuclear weapon, and then with uh, these poor guys mobilized in Russia, go to this territory where will be chaos and death and, I don't know, desperation, and uh, make this bitter end. I can only say what the Chancellor always said. The Chancellor said, we will not accept this. Mm. This is not how it's going to work, that Russia says, OK, we, we uh, uh, occupied the territory we wanted to occupy, and now let's talk and we keep what we have. Uh, that's not how it's going. Uh, how it's going to work, and I, I think it's not how it should work, because what's the message then? Whatever territory Russia in the future will say it will take, uh, it can take then, because that's what we're saying. And I don't think that uh, uh, Europe can agree to this, and I don't think uh, this American president will agree to this. A future president might. Who knows? Uh, Roman, he will, uh, Putin will undoubtedly also conscript men from these annexed areas to fight against their, their own countrymen in, in Ukraine. Uh, do you think that's realistic, that they will actually fight? Well, this is already happening, and uh, this has been happening for some time now, especially in the regions of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, people have been fighting there on the side of de facto Russia uh, for half a year at least, and some of them even in the years before. Yes, they are fighting. The morale is low, and we've seen that um, the Ukrainian success in the north of Ukraine, in the region of Kharkiv, where in early September the Ukrainian army was able to um, liberate large parts of uh, occupied territories, and which was uh, probably one of the uh, most successful Ukrainian operations in the start of this war. Um, the part of the Ukrainian success was that in those parts there were a lot of uh, uh, conscripts from Donbass, so uh, mm. people who are actually Ukrainians and were forced, or some of them maybe wanted to fight against Ukraine. So there was very low morale there and they just fled. Mm. So you mentioned a low morale and that uh, leads us nicely to uh, our next uh, little report. Putin has also mobilized 300,000 more men to fight uh, in Ukraine, Russian men that is, but the mobilization has hit a big obstacle. Thousands of would-be conscripts just don't want to die for Putin's imperial aspirations and are fleeing Russia in droves, mostly to neighboring countries. A quick I do, and then it's time to say goodbye. Andre has been drafted and must now go to war. I have mixed feelings, but mostly fear of the unknown. These are the scenes all over Russia, families bidding farewell to men, fathers, and sons. 300,000 reservists have been conscripted. Putin's partial mobilization has begun, but many are not boarding the buses to the front. Instead, they are leaving the country as quickly as possible. There are estimates that more than a quarter of a million men have already fled within the past week. We have a choice. Either we go to the front or we go to prison. Anyone who takes to the streets to protest the war is also threatened with imprisonment. The police quash these demonstrations with brutal violence. In Siberia, a reservist shot a draft dodger in the head out of pure anger, critically wounding him. Murder and death have reached the center of Russian society. 
Will Putin have enough soldiers for his war? Yes, Maria. Uh, will he? I mean, we just in the report, we heard the number 250,000 that have uh, uh, left. What are you hearing? Uh, the people who left for the yesterday uh, numbers is absolutely the same uh, of n the numbers of the troop, uh, the border on 24th of February. It's just like symbolic number. It's uh, around 200,000, but uh, probably more today and will be more in the next days if they will not shut uh, the borders, mm. because uh, this is a huge possibility they will do it today or tomorrow. Mm. Yeah, and um, 25 million of uh, men in Russia could fight, I mean, theoretically. So but there are many people mood? left. <laughs> what's the mood then in, in Russia about this mobilization? What are you hearing? Uh, people are in terror, absolutely, because what's, uh, it's like 24th of February again. And for mm -hmm. many people in Russia, it's the first time because they denied uh, the idea that Russia could invade other countries, especially Ukraine, which is so close in many senses to Russia. And um, yes, so now they could not deny it. It's like just <laughs> in front of their faces and uh, their husbands and their sons receiving this military's letters. Uh, and yeah, and this is a huge terror and people try not to stay at night at their flats mm. in fear that uh, they will come for them. Um, I'm talking about those who could not flee at the moment. And many of them could not because people in the poor regions in far north in Siberia, like in north of Siberia, they just couldn't make it. I mean, uh, they couldn't pay for the airline tickets. It mm. costs a lot. Uh, several days ago, Mm, the airline ticket to Yerevan, the last one, costs around uh, 2 million rubles. It's like how many? It's 9,000 euro. No, that, could that, you can imagine that? that? says something. So people want to flee probably, but they could not. So they will choose between jail and uh, the war, as you mm. see in your video. Uh, Daniel, uh, the, uh, the view from, from neighboring countries, former Soviet republics, what, what, are, you, uh, what are you seeing there? Well, that is interesting because uh, um, they, are of course, uh, they are of course worried. Mm. Look at Kazakhstan, for example. They welcome very much. They welcome. They welcome those. They welcome those uh, those people. Georgia as well. That is not surprising. Uh, Georgia is in opposition to what is uh, what is happening in Russia. Yes, of course, they are. They are a little bit worried that the balance might not be not be uh, uh, too favorable. Uh, but uh, this is one of the things we see that uh, that um, uh, Putin is losing support even in countries and at regimes that have been quite supportive. Uh, um, of course, for us outside of Russia, it's a little bit ambivalent. Mm -hmm. um, we have been looking at a situation where we were uh, seeing a society uh, enjoying summer while uh, we had a terrible war in Ukraine and many people didn't seem to care a lot. Now they care. I think from our point of view, it's good if men leave and don't want to fight, but still it's hard to forget that Russian society did not really care a lot about this war before. Mm, talking about Russian society, I would like to put that question uh, uh, to Roman uh, uh, there. As we said earlier, this conscription drive makes it very palpable for average Russians all over the country that the war has arrived in their country. Will it change the mood? Well, it is already changing the mood, and um, it's it's an experiment we haven't seen for decades in Russia, since the Second World War, I would say. We haven't seen this in Afghanistan in the 80s or when Russia was fighting in Chechnya in the 90s. So it is a completely new dimension for the Russian society, and it takes time for the society to digest what is really happening. And I think um, it is a very great danger for Vladimir Putin, but he thinks he can ride this wave. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, um, I have this idea that maybe he's actually, um, um, he thinks it is going according to the plan. Because remember when he first spoke, when the war began, he said that it would clean the Russian society. Mm 
so people who are against uh, this this war or against uh, me as president, they will just be killed or go away. And now we are seeing a kind of consolidation that he actually wanted. People who don't want uh, to fight, who do not support him, f- are fleeing the country. People who stay, who go, uh, who just uh, sit in the, uh, on that on those buses and and uh, let themselves be driven to the front line and uh, probably die in the coming weeks or days or months. Um, this is what his plan was. Mm. So um, uh, from that point of view, it is going according to his plan. He's consolidating the society. So don't we think that this will actually increase the protests? What are, what are you hearing there from, from, from Russia? Probably, but it's not a question of days, unfortunately. And probably we have this weeks and months to wait until people will be mm-hmm. brave enough to do it. Because uh, it was a years and years of terror, actually. It's very difficult to go to the street knowing for sure that will take you away, they will be, you will be raped, I don't know, or even killed in police. And so it's, <laughs> you have to be a hero to do this, an absolutely desperate hero. How many such a people in society, in any society? So people should be angry so much that at the same moment, the whole nation will just stand up and go to the streets. If one million people will be on the streets of Moscow, that will be the end of Putin is there, absolutely. But it should be a moment, a moment of huge national anger. What I want to say, uh, and which I say very important, <laughs> I think, uh, well, which I think very important to say, that we have two biggest national shame, I mean, Russians. Uh, the first one, that's lack of empathy to Ukrainians. And you, you were talking about society which lived uh, through nice summer, but this is all right, this is how Things are now. We know how it happened during Second Great World War because in some places there were huge fights, and in other places people just lived through the summer. But for Russians, it couldn't be so. They should do, do absolutely opposite thing. They should stop tanks. I don't know what, mm. whatever, but they didn't, and they didn't even believe. They made them do not believe that this is true. And the second national shame is that mothers just send their children to die to the front. I couldn't, I couldn't believe this. Only in Dagestan, in Caucasus uh, region, uh, people are mm. brave enough and like strong enough to, to go to the streets and mothers do not, uh, they're just not afraid of anything because the biggest uh, scare of a mother that to see her own child to, to die. In. So what else, what else should happen? But Dagestan is an interesting point Absolutely. because, because of course, they ask themselves why should they die for a Russian empire, and this, this is, is going thing. to destabilize yeah, yeah, yeah. the Russian empire as we see it today a lot, I think. Mm. Because Putin told for years that uh, uh, the West want to divide us. They won't uh, see the whole Russia. They wanted to separate it by regions. We will never do this. But he's doing by his own hands this. Exactly. We have a video from Yakutia. I mean, we like on East West, where a guy said, oh, I mean, I don't have any against uh, the thought to defend my country, but this is not my war. This is the war between Russia and Ukraine, he said. He's from Yakutia. I said, like, what? Really? So fast? So this is a huge um, menace for Putin, but mm. probably in another way than just protest on the streets. I have to interrupt you here. We have to come to our final round of statements. And uh, I want to ask a question that you hinted on. You called it uh, Russian shame. Um, in the big picture, what does this war, no matter um, how it ends, mean for Russia's place in the world in the future, briefly, if you can. Uh, it's a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe because economically it's a catastrophe. It is, uh, it is uh, talking about w- uh, place in the world. Even countries like China uh, are not going to ally with a country that I hope uh, will be defeated in a way that we all have to hope that Russia, Russia will at least be defeated in Ukraine. So uh, it's a disaster. Mm. Roman, what's your view? Where, where does this war leave Russia in the future? Well, I think we are witnessing the last phase of Putin's rule and uh, Russia as we knew it under Putin for more than 20 years is ending. And uh, the new Russia will be weaker, much weaker uh, in the world than it was before. Mm. Maria. Um... Weaker. 
I hope Russia will be a better place to live after all. But when uh, this future will come? You're asking about future, but what distance we're talking about? Well, the Russia after Putin, probably. The next day, it will be very bad. <laughs> but how long will be the, this next day? It's a question. And uh, we know now that many of us journalists, independent journalists from Russia, we couldn't go back uh, in the short distance future because we will face 15 years of jail and so on. But um, probably we, will, we couldn't come in five years as well. I don't know. I don't know. It's a disaster. Yeah, I agree. Thank you very much uh, to my panel here. Uh, that was it for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed our discussion and you can join the conversation. If you're watching us uh, on YouTube, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, put your thoughts in the comments below right here. And that's it from me. I'm Gerhard Alpers in Berlin. From me and the To The Point team, thanks for watching.